Hey y'all, Scott here. I've been doing a lot of thinking about myself, figuring out who I am, what I was meant to do. The one thing I can do that nobody else can. It's blowing up garbage. It's already been done. If there's one thing I want playing Game Boy, it's restraint. I can do that myself. Handheld gaming has always been one of the most popular forms of gaming, but it just can't accomplish what a home console can. More powerful hardware, better feeling control. While handhelds have their place, some games just work better on console. Thus, many portable exclusives got repackaged for a home release. Case in point, Secret Agent Clank. I'm not playing that out there. I had always dreamed of a handheld capable of console experiences all my life. And in 2005, all my prayers were answered with the PlayStation Portable, the fabled home console to go. Finally. The PSP was pretty damn close to a PlayStation 2 quality wise. I mean, it wasn't as good, but on a screen as small as this, it can be hard to tell. But because of the comparison, one can make between PS2 and PSP games, numerous PS2 era series made the jump to portables with the PSP. Ratchet and Clang, Jack and Daxter each got exclusive entries on this little guy and played very similarly to their home console counterparts. Series like Grand Theft Auto, however, already had pre-existing examples of handheld entries. Grand Theft Auto, Liberty City Stories, and Vice City Stories. Two original GTA titles exclusively for the PSP. That is incredible and something you just don't see these days. It would be one thing to play Grand Theft Auto 3 on the go, but to play a game on par with Grand Theft Auto 3 on the go, that's an original game to boot? I mean, with how expensive game development is these days, they would have just put any old GTA game on the PSP, which makes Liberty City and Vice City stories that much more special to me. The first time we were finally able to play 3D Grand Theft Auto on the go and they were totally unique adventures for eight months. Yes, the great PSP to PS2 migration. Because of how similar games looked on both platforms, the PSP was great for PS2 games to run on it, and vice versa. It's surprising just how many PSP exclusives made their way over to the PS2, considering how this was a few years into the PlayStation 3's life. I never underestimate how well the PS2 sold. With an install base of over 150 million systems, you'd be stupid not to be stupid. It's supporting the PlayStation 2 without actually supporting the PlayStation 2. You can finally let your neighbors know you're playing Secret Agent Clank without solicitation. These games came to PSP first, later coming to PS2, which happened mostly later in the system's life with games like Siphon Filter Logan Shadow releasing on the platform as late as 2010. That was the year God of War 3 released, like Jesus Christ. But you know, Sony, I have to give you credit. Ford won't service my Model T anymore and you know damn well they wouldn't release Secret Agent Clank for it either. Well, let's take a look at some of these PSP to PS2 conversions. The Grand Theft Auto games were some of the earliest ones with Liberty City Stories releasing on the PSP in October of 2005 and later on the PS2 in June of 2006. It's a more than serviceable GTA game on both platforms, so a few features were cut from the PS2 version. There's no multiplayer and no custom soundtracks. You can't play your own music like you can on the PSP. There's also no snow on the PS2 version of one specific mission. PlayStation 2 release does look nicer with higher quality graphics, textures, effects, the works. Though it does look more dull to me, but that could be the realism taking over. The PS2 game looks better, and by better, I mean fucking depressing. It's nowhere near as good looking as Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, it's still the same PSP game at its core, which you have to get used to with conversions like this. A jump from handheld to console truly does outline how these games aren't nearly as impressive when played at home on the big screen. Sure, it looks nicer now, but I can't take it on the go anymore, so now there's not as much of an excuse why the fingers do what the fingers want. Yeah, the game looks more realistic now. I'm also legally blind. Liberty City Stories was only $20 on PlayStation 2 at launch though. Half the PSP version's price due to cutting multiplayer in the custom soundtracks, which made this an absolute bargain. I mean, we haven't even covered the mere fact that the game controls leagues better here than on PSP simply due to the second analog stick and a set of shoulder buttons. Have you ever played a PSP game? Yeah, you have. You've cried. The stuff you're willing to put up with for the sake of portability. I mean, it's far from unplayable. Hell, it's damn near tolerable. But having to stop and hold the left shoulder button to move the camera can be brutally annoying. The PS2 version is far more comfortable to play in this regard but it's not nearly as enjoyable. I'm gonna be honest, most AAA PSP exclusives like this, their charm comes from the fact they're on the PSP. They're good games at their core, but when you put them on something like a PS2, a lot of that magic is lost for me. They 
may play and look better, but Liberty City Stories was always meant to be a portable, traditional GTA game. So when you take away the portability, it's still good, but you just get this feeling when you're playing it on PS2. I should have finished high school. Liberty City Stories is better on PS2. Play it on PSP. It plays fine on the go, and this was where it was meant to be played. Plus, it's still a huge novelty playing games like this on a system this tiny. Playing on the PS2, you'll be asking yourself why you aren't just playing San Andreas. And the same goes for the game's sequel, Vice City Stories, released on PSP in October of 2006 and PS2 in March of 2007. Multiplayer on PSP, cut from PS2. Though the PS2 version received exclusive bonus content. Pretty minor stuff, but stuff nonetheless. Couple that with better visuals and controls, and you also have the better version of Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories, the worst one. You can make that argument about most PSP to PS2 games. For example, Motor Storm Arctic Edge. PSP in September of 2009, PS2 in October of 2009. Jesus, Sony, let me blink! Motorstorm was a graphical showcase on PlayStation 3. The mud effects, the car crashes, the lighting, all in glorious HD. While the game itself was fun, you are more than likely buying it to look at something. Arctic Edge was the PSP's entry in the series, and for the PSP, this is great. And the PS2, however? Like, man, this is the screen I play Motorstorm on. Don't show this. The graphical downgrade is far more welcome on the handheld. On TV, like, we already had two Motorstorm games in HD before this. The series was born in HD, and you think this is going to be exciting? While it does have split-screen multiplayer unlike the PSP version, it does lack the online multiplayer, the photo mode, the custom soundtracks. Arctic Edge on PS2 isn't bad, but its existence is far more questionable than the PSP release. Yes, PS2 owners in 2009 deserved a fun racing game, because I'm scared what they'd do if they weren't kept busy. But it just feels weird to play this game on my TV when it's technically newer than this game. Twisted Metal Head-On at least took much longer to come to PlayStation 2, with the PSP version releasing in March of 2005 as a launch title for the handheld, and the PS2 version coming out in February of 2008. Some titled Extra Twisted Edition. This is f Ah, this feels much more natural to me than Motorstorm on PS2. I mean, there was no Twisted Metal on PS3 at the time, and as Twisted Metal Black was one of the first major games on the console, this felt like a fitting swan song for the PlayStation 2. Five years later, Head-On Extra Twisted Edition is amazing. It can always be considered a new game with the amount of content added. Sure, online multiplayer was taken out, but in its place are all kinds of doodads. A new level, an entirely separate mode with stages from a cancelled sequel to Twisted Metal Black. The being able to play as the Twisted Metal mascot Sweet Tooth outside of the car, which was a first for the series. Bonus footage, including a documentary and cut endings for the first Twisted Metal. Like, oh my god, this made the jump to console with pride. And this made it out of spite. I'm bending the rules with this one a bit. Hopefully the government follows suit. I'd marry this game just to put it through divorce. Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier was released for PSP and PS2 on the exact same day, but you can't fool me. This was always a PlayStation portable game, and they just put it out on PS2 at the last minute. Because without the PS2 version releasing, well, let's thank God it did. This is just one of those PSP entries in a franchise. You know the ones. Oh, this doesn't matter to the core story. Oh, it's made by a B-team developer, not the original developer of the series. Oh, it's a handheld, so who gives a sh**? And what's worse about it, this isn't even a good one of those games! The Lost Frontier suffers from just being directionless, putting the series into the hands of people who had no idea how to extend the franchise past the original trilogy on PlayStation 2, both gameplay and story-wise. Which is what's so insulting about this one, the fact that it's on PS2 right next to the rest of them! If it was a PSP exclusive, I don't think it would be nearly as offensive, like, oh, it's just a little handheld spin-off. No, you can play this below a ceiling, it's f***ing scary! Imagine and Clank size matters on PSP, I get the title. It's just supposed to be a reference to being on a smaller screen. Cute. On PS2, the reference doesn't land. If it's not on a handheld, what does this mean? I have no earthly clue, which is why I prefer the version released in other regions. Ratchet and Clank, your c*** is small. This was developed by the same team who did The Lost Frontier, so yes, this is one of their talents. Do you think they can sing? Size Matters is perfectly fine, but the PSP version is generally considered better as it's a more fully complete and stable release. Size Matters on PS2 can be glitchy with a worse camera that's oftentimes too close to your character. It came to the console just over a year after the PSP release, but they didn't add anything in that time. If anything, they cut content. No more multiplayer as per usual, but in addition, strangely, one cutscene is missing in the PS2 port. It took them a year to change their mind. It all comes down to secret Agent Clank. It always does. These three games just 
don't work on a console in the context they're presented in. Of course, does that mean I never want them on a console? No. You know, maybe an eventual remaster in an HD system, that would be great. But these released on PS2 fairly close or day and day with their respective PSP versions, and you can tell they were only ever meant to be smaller scale PSP games, but puked onto the PlayStation 2 to give that system a few more new releases. Come on, Secret Agent Clank on PS2? Birds running for Senate? It's the same thing. How the hell did you get here? A lot of these games don't make sense on PlayStation 2. Now, it doesn't mean they can't be on a console ever. No, no, no. I mean in the context of a brand new PlayStation 2 game at the time you buy at the store and are expecting a PlayStation 2 game from. There is often nothing denoting these are anything but a standard PlayStation 2 game. And while all these games work fine on the console, them being here kind of highlights how many handheld games are truly designed around that smaller experience. I'm telling you man, these games were just meant to be played in an environment where you're not expecting as much from them, because once you put them on a console, it's in the rival gang's territory. A few other PSP games made their way over to PS2, like Wipeout Pulse in Europe and the Siphon Filter games, showing that this was a lucrative plan for Sony. I mean, take some game that's already done and put it on a console that can run it easily and you have yourself a recipe for non-success, I'd say existence, which is why they kept up with this plan with the PlayStation Vita, kinda sorta. You'd think Vita games like Uncharted Golden Abyss and Killzone Mercenary would've been quick and dirty PlayStation 3 games to spit out in 2014 after the PS4 launched to give their previous console one last year of big name Sony games, but I think the state of gaming at the time would have made such a strategy pretty flawed. The PS3 was positioned as this blockbuster powerhouse. When an Uncharted game was playing on it, you knew. So taking these Vita games and doing a quick and dirty blow up, I don't think it would have worked as well. The PS3 had a reputation with graphics. The PS2 didn't. Yeah, put whatever on this thing. Sony will, why can't I? Well, yeah, some PSP games were remastered for PS3. Those were labeled as such. It wasn't like how it was back on the PS2, like, oh, well, this is supposed to be played indoors. However, a few PlayStation Vita games made their way over to PlayStation 3. First up, Hot Shots Golf World Invitational. Originally a Vita launch title in early 2012, the PS3 release occurred digitally only in the summer of 2013. A larger scale game like this being digital only definitely undermines its importance in my opinion. I mean, this is the sixth mainline game in the Hot Shots Golf series. It wasn't just like a handheld spinoff, no, it was literally numbered six in Japan. And the PS3 version is no slouch at all, basically everything from the Vita original is here, accounted for, and then some. I'm sure you lack the touchscreen support now, and that portion of the game is obviously worse, but this is the same game now, with much better visuals, free DLC, extra content, and modes. The user interface still feels tailor-made for a portable, but this is the same game, yet better. I honestly wish they did more Vita ports like this on PS3. Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation was a companion title to not Assassin's Creed 2. It was only on the Vita, and by damn it, you can tell. I think they promised Sony an exclusive Assassin's Creed before thinking this deal through. What is that? This game just didn't have the budget to be what it should have been. It's not that the Vita couldn't handle a full-fledged Assassin's Creed game, it's that Ubisoft couldn't handle a full-fledged Assassin's Creed game for the Vita. It's a shame, considering this game's story and characters have some massive potential. The main character may be one of the most interesting in the entire series, but it's all in just a whatever side game. Well, a little over a year after the initial release, Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation HD launched digitally on PS3, 360, and PC. That'll solve everything. When you blow a game like this up, it really does highlight the problems it had originally. While it's far more accessible this way, it's now so much easier to see where concessions were made with the core game design to get this title out in time and within budget for a failing handheld. Like, come on. While this is the definitive way to play the game, it will never not feel like an awkward experience. On a home console, you're just going to be comparing it to the superior Assassin's Creed titles. On the Vita? You're playing it on the Vita. At least with a game like Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, that's less of a wannabe home console game to go and more of its own thing. This launched right alongside Arkham Origins on 3DS and Vita and is a 2.5D side scroller. The camera angles try to trick you into thinking it's anything but, however, I'm no fool. I bought this game thrice. Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate Deluxe Edition came to Wii U, 360, PS3, and PC just a little over five months later. Digitally only, including numerous extra features, new difficulty options, costumes, maps, the works. This game, 
I don't have a problem with on consoles. It's so different from the core Arkham games that it feels more like a unique spin-off rather than something trying to pass off as a traditional entry like Liberation or The Lost Frontier. Of course, the only reason why they did a 2D Batman Arkham game is to put it on a handheld, but that doesn't take away from this being a unique experience anywhere you play it. And visually, it's a nice bump up from the Vita. From the 3DS, uh, I wouldn't call it a step up. I would call it a fucking step up. 3DS games coming to home consoles is a godsend. Hey, I love this stupid piece of shit. But it is a stupid piece of shit. Have you seen this screen? Because I can't. Some games, as good as they were on here, you just wish they were somewhere else. And thankfully, a handful of titles did such a deed, starting off with Resident Evil Revelations. A technical showpiece for the 3DS, no doubt. I mean, this looks like an Xbox 360 game that was censored. As cool as it is, Revelations was a 3DS exclusive initially, and it ran and looked and sounded as good as it did. This is a game it just feels right with a controller on a big screen TV. This was originally seen as a bit of a return to form for the series, as recent entries were more action focused with this one more horror focused. And because of that, man, this type of experience just works better at home as on a handheld, if something scares you, it's more accessible to be a bitch. Listen, I love Revelations as a 3DS game. It was made for the platform and is undeniably impressive. However, it's obvious where this would work better. Unlike the PSP Grand Theft Autos and Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation, Revelations is more of its own type of game rather than trying to be a portable companion title. So because of that, I think it feels quite at home on a big TV. It doesn't feel like it's trying to be something that it's not, but that doesn't take away from the original release. Now, I'm a simple man. I don't play Castlevania Lords of Shadow Mirror of Fate, and I live my life by that motto. And now I'm ruining my life's work. You know what surprised me how quick this went from 3DS to 360 and PS3, but in reality, it was kind of the other way around as the title was initially developed for those systems, then ported down to 3DS, then ported up to 360 and PS3. Seems a bit backwards, but hey, it exempts it from being a game going from handheld to console technically. The law can be a up thing. Now, Nintendo isn't immune to bringing their own handheld titles to home consoles, though not nearly as often as you'd think. Sushi Striker The Way of Sushido released on Nintendo 3DS and Nintendo Switch on the same day. However, it was originally revealed as a 3DS exclusive. Out of all 3DS games to bring to Switch, I see how it is. This was always a strange game to make the jump, not because it's bad, but because of the type of game it was. A 2D puzzle game played across two screens using touch. Yeah, it's perfect for my home theater setup. A good bit of the gameplay had to be adjusted to work on a singular display, but they made it happen. It's obvious this was brought over due to the simplicity of it all. All this 2D art was more than likely created in HD to begin with, so it wouldn't have required as much work as, say, bringing Kirby Battle Royale over to the platform. While I'm happy this game got twice as much of a chance to succeed due to being on more systems, I don't think the split timelines are much different. Honestly, if this game should have gone anywhere, I think it would have fit perfectly on mobile phones. I mean, just picturing the Switch footage on a smartphone, it just looks right, I don't know. It's hard to make games that were designed for handhelds look at home elsewhere sometimes, but damn it, Nintendo tried. Metopia made the leap from 3DS to Switch with a beautiful facelift. I sure some models and environments look a bit more simple and or blocky, but for the most part, this looks like a modern Nintendo game. That doesn't take away from the fact that why? Why bring this over? This isn't even a Sushi Striker situation where like, oh, it's easy to bring over. This had to get a whole graphical facelift, extra content, in addition to consolidating everything to one screen. I guess out of all 3DS games they could bring to Switch, Miitopia filled the biggest void. I mean, why bring Zelda Link Between Worlds over when you already have Link's Awakening? Why Metroid Samus Returns when you already have Dread? Why Yoshi's New Island when you already have Depression? Nintendo is pretty conservative with bringing old handheld titles to a home system, and I think that shows how they have a vastly different philosophy behind this kind of stuff. More often they put console games on handhelds, even though putting handheld games on consoles seems to me like it would be easier. But they seem to only really do it when they have a reason to, whether it's to present a game in a new light or with a new gimmick. Kirby's Dream Land on the Game Boy received a truncated remake within Kirby Superstar, and WarioWare Mega Microgames from the Game Boy Advance was brought over to the GameCube via Mega Party Games. This is basically a stripped down version of that GBA game with multiplayer modes. Yes, a stripped down Game Boy Advance game released for the GameCube. When mom said I could be anything when I was older, I surely didn't think she'd meant I'd be an owner of this. Mega Party Games is so weird. Like it's basically just an excuse to give you multiplayer modes to play all the 
of WarioWare micro games in? The single player is just basically a playlist of all the micro games. No story cutscenes or extra unlockables like in the GBA version. The micro games don't even hide the fact they're from the Game Boy Advance. It definitely helps that the multiplayer modes are as fun as they are, but this is such a limited game. I feel like they removed more features than they added. I understand this is for multiplayer, but for a straight conversion of the original with no graphical enhancements whatsoever, loads of content ripped out and a handful of multiplayer modes added in, I can't help but feel that it's not enough for how little was done and how much was removed from the core game. Well, WarioWare struck again on the Wii with the downloadable only WarioWare DIY Showcase, which was a companion title to WarioWare DIY on the Nintendo DS. While the DS game focused on game creation, Showcase is just that, a showcase for those created games. You could transfer them from the DS wirelessly to play on the big screen, though you could still play Showcase as its own smaller WarioWare game, complete with cutscenes and exclusive micro games made with DIY on the DS. These are not the same games though, they're complementary to each other, unlike the downloadable Phoenix Wright games on Wii. Whatever the definition of trying is, I know what it isn't. Some developers thought to bring their Nintendo DS franchises over to the Wii. I mean, it made some sense. Touch screen, using the Wii Remote's pointer. Yeah, that works. Let's see Drawn to Life on a console. You know, there's not as many handheld games that make the jump to consoles as you may expect, and going through all these releases, it kind of makes sense. Listen, if all handheld games could be on console and all console games could be on handheld, that would be the dream, but I don't think handheld games always feel right in the home. Many were designed in very different ways compared to the console counterparts. Uh, they can be much more compact with unique structures like episodic and mission-based formulas. Not that those are bad or don't belong on consoles, it's just different and shows how separate handheld and console gaming can be. But these brave companies went against the norm and sacrificed design integrity for lazy money. Godspeed. I would never do that for lazy money. I just lazily commit mail fraud. However, one company is in my opinion, the king of bringing handheld to console. Well, more so Jester. During the reign of the Sega Genesis, Sega introduced the Game Gear as their handheld competition towards Nintendo's Game Boy, utilizing incredibly similar technology to the Genesis's predecessor, the Sega Master System, which also was still being supported at the time. The Master System experienced continued success throughout the 90s in Europe and especially Brazil, so while in North America it was all but forgotten, the console kept on receiving releases, with many coming from the Game Gear and many Game Gear titles coming from it. Yeah, Sonic 1, 2, and Chaos for the Game Gear came from the Master System, though Sonic Blast and Spinball went from Game Gear to Master System. Same with Streets of Rage 1 and 2, Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Mean Machine, and loads of licensed games. This was Sega's strategy with these consoles. They were basically one and the same for a bit there, and it made sense. It was a very smart way to go about supporting both platforms but it severely takes away from both systems' libraries. The Sega Master System version was almost always superior just due to being a bit more powerful and not having to zoom the screen in as much as the Game Gear versions did. And God damn it, it is great to finally play Sonic 1 on a TV. Wow. If this whole experience has taught me anything, it's that handheld games, they got more going on than you may think. Oftentimes rooted in their design is something fundamentally different than what you'd find on a home console, which makes many of these conversions a bit awkward. But that just makes me respect these handheld entries even more. They're more complex than they seem. Just because something's smaller doesn't mean they don't have a lot going on. They can imagine if I was smaller, like an ant. Can you imagine if I was an ant? I wish I couldn't.